everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise, your favorite baseball history podcast. My name is Jeff. I'm one part of the show. The uh, other part is my esteemed colleague in the Pacific Northwest. It is Mark A. Johnston. I think I put enough emphasis on those words to stress your importance. That was that was some impressive emphasis. Yeah, uh, all on the right syllables, too. Yes. Did you take an emphasis class in school? <laughs> no, I, I minored in emphasis. Oh, so okay. Uh, I I I don't know. I don't know where to go from there. So let's just get right into this, Mark. This is uh, this is really the first time we've had a show in a couple of weeks where we're going to talk about various topics because last week we just stuck to the A's and the week before that I was mourning the A's. So it's been like two or three weeks since we've got to kind of catch up on the stuff that we usually do. Right. Catching up is important, but it was also important to discuss this chapter in baseball history. Yeah. Now that that's, well, I don't think it's over, but now that we're, we're past that episode, we're going to go into the, uh, into some of our more normal stuff. Mark, this is episode number 265, 265. Seinfeld only had 180 episodes. Oh, wow. Sabrina, the teenage witch only 168. And this is 265 for us. Man, I'm not going to why because no one can take us off the air because yeah. we run the show. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how many episodes the Simpsons have because they are yeah. ahead of us. Yeah, I would imagine so. But, you know, they only put out like 26 episodes a year, too. And they're only they're only a half hour. We're out here doing hour long shows every week. But there is no off season for us, Mark. I feel like they make more money for doing less than we do. <laughs> we, yes, we should probably change agents is probably. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Speaking of not having much work to do, uh, I want to give a shout out to to Bernie Brewer. First, I mean, yes, of course, the Brewers now have an entire offseason courtesy of the Mets. But also, Mark, you know my feelings on mascots. They're, for some reason, they're they're drawn to me and like to bother me while I'm actually trying to watch a baseball game. Or they're standing on a dugout right in front of me in my line of sight. But not Bernie. They cause they stick him up there in that chalet at America First Stadium, and he's up there. Sometimes yes. he gets to slide down, but then he has to go back up. He's not bothering anybody up there. At, Good point, yes. At least not me, which is obviously the most important thing. But uh, same thing with the rally monkey. He's just on the video screen. He's not out there, like, flinging his feces at people in the <laughs> stand, which would be me. Too. He would he would target me right away. But I just want to give a shout out to all mascots that do not interact with the crowd. Tip of the cap to you. But, Mark, let's get on to some more topical stuff here. Can we talk about Francisco Lindor? Oh, absolutely. We need to. Now, I've literally been listening to this song on repeat for like the last day and a half. The Mets... <laughs> Beat the Brewers to advance to the ALDS and then beat the Phillies? How are the Phillies losing in the first round? But Francisco Lindor, late home run wins uh, on the final day of the season against Atlanta to get into the playoffs. And he just casually jogs around the bases like it was like a spring training interleague. Yeah. I gotta say, I really like that. Yeah, that's 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 my whole point here is because Pete Alonso the same thing when he hit a home run against Milwaukee and he just kind of went around the bases. Now, obviously, we're here. We love pimped home run trots. We, we like we're all, we're all for letting the letting the kids play and having fun. But this is how I always wanted. I imagined I would react in that situation. I wanted to act like I'd been there before, get in the dugout and then celebrate with my teammates. Yes. And both he and Lindor and Alonzo have done that so far, which is, I think, is really cool. Kind of the opposite of Jesse Winker. Yeah. yeah. That dude, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I guess he's kind of one of those, it looks like he's playing with his hair on fire kind of guy. But I'm not sure anybody's ever really liked Jesse Winker. No, including his teammates. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of get that feeling, too. Like, the Mets are happy for him because he's come up with some big clutch extra base hits. Since coming to the Mets, I I think he is actually one of the best pickups at the deadline for this team because he does play with his like his like his hairs on fire. But I kind of notice his reactions and stuff. I don't think they sit well with most of the team 
and they'll congratulate him when he does something. That's, that's but, what I have been. No, I've thought the exact same thing. It's it was that like that with the Mariners too. Do you think? Um, yeah, it, it was. It was kind of weird how I mean he almost got into a brawl with, with the, the entire Angels. other team. Yeah, and uh, so that was kind of weird. But uh, the fans kind of stood behind him um, and said, "Ah, oh, he took on the other team." But it, then after when they clinched, okay, to go to the playoffs, the whole team was going crazy on the infield, and he was sitting by himself in right field on the ground. It was weird. Yeah, <laughs> it is. He's a yeah. He's a weird guy. I mean, he's not like Milton Bradley kind of. <laughs> you know, he's just an awful person all the time. He's just, he's just, he's a little bit, I mean, Zach Grinke's a little bit off too, but just in a little bit different way. But right, right, yeah. I legitimately, though, think that Jesse Winker was one of the best pickups at the trade deadline. He is he, just. He's done a lot for the Mets. Yeah, he, he really has. And he's kind of given them an edge and maybe just a little nudge, but. It's the playoffs, man. Every, everything is exciting. Speaking of the playoffs, the Mets, Phillies, and the Dodgers, Padres, or, or the NLDS series here. Of course, the Mets already clinched. But it has the shortest combined geographic distance in league division series history. There's only 233 miles total. Citizens Bank to City Field, it's 110 miles. And Dodger Stadium to Petco Park is 120 miles. So that's uh, okay. easy to go to all the games there. The only shorter distance between two teams in the same league would have been the Cubs and the Brewers, where American Family is only 87 miles from Wrigley Field. That's, I mean, you could be a season ticket holder and live in Milwaukee and get to all the Cubs games. This is true. Speaking of playoffs and Tigers, I guess we haven't really mentioned Detroit yet, but for the first time in history, the Detroit Tigers, the Hanshin Tigers, and the Kia Tigers will all make the playoffs in the same year. Wow. So good the year of the Tiger. Good year to be. Good. Yeah. If you're a Tiger fan, this is, this is the, the year for you. Speaking of things that have never happened in history before, here's something that happens all the time. There's something popular like uh, Jose Iglesias' OMG, the song we talked about earlier. It's not going to be an all match episode, I promise. It was always last week. It's not going to be all match this week. But uh, Pitbull has uh, gotten in on a remix with Jose Iglesias. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is not it. This is the original because this is the best, but it's not pit balls, not Florida. So, Mark, you and I had texted about this, and I know I know you wanted to talk about it. MLB has announced that during the All-Star game next year, players will be wearing their home white and road gray uniforms. Yes. I am so excited for this. Yeah, this I, I I remember replying, hey, they're listening to the podcast. Yeah. Because we've been big proponents of this. Yeah. Now, this is my question. I would love it if it if it truly was home white and road grays. But I get the feeling that like three quarters of, of the all stars are going to be wearing alternate jerseys. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to sell those jerseys. How often do you have to wear the alternate jerseys for the originals to become alternate? I will ask the Mariners. They wear those high school BP jerseys all the time. When, when they <laughs> when they wear their home whites, I get excited because they usually tweet out what uniform they're going to wear, and I cannot help but to respond sometimes when they're the the dark blue ones. Yeah, you love those, don't you? Oh my god, those are just so. They're not major league uniforms. <laughs> Other teams have some like that, too, that I don't like. But the Mariners, I think, is is the most egregious in terms of we wear hats and sleeves at this level kind of thing. <laughs> but I'm excited for that. I mean, because when you think about that, we often think about the those kind of all star pictures from the early 80s where literally there's like 13 different color uniforms out there, which is cool. But those were their actual uniforms. Those weren't alternates. So yeah, now are the uh, the home uniforms going to have just a little patch on it that says All Star, or is it going to be redesigned, you know, with different colors, uh, same I'm jersey but different colors oh, to no. say it's an All Star? Oh, I I don't think so. I read this as as their jerseys. They'll probably have a patch on the sleeve that says you know All Star Game. Yeah, that I can deal with. 
Yeah. And then they'll have they'll sell some sponsor too that will probably be on the other sleeve. I'm Wait, sure. Do you know what this this Strauss is that's on the batting helmets of everybody in the playoffs? No, no, what's that? Oh, I have no idea and I have not bothered to look it up because I I'm like if I've never heard of them I clearly and if they can afford to put that on on MLB batting helmets across the league uh, clearly it's it's probably some chemical company or some financial thing that I I'm don't performing work gear. Is that really what it is? Well, it's something Strauss. Well, that's Levi Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is. I don't think this, this is, is Levi's. <laughs> what, what, what did Levi break off? <laughs> they had a falling out. I guess Levi and Strauss. It's a it's a German based apparel company. Huh? I maybe I don't know. Like I said, I don't care. And if they're gonna stick the if they're gonna stick ads on the batting helmets, I'm certainly not gonna go out of my way to find out who they are. Maybe they should have a little, little explanation next to it. Yeah, they, <laughs> really little. Or you would think they would have a commercial at some point during one of these games, right? Like, how many people yeah, say, know hey, what this check is? Out our, check out our stuff. So this Strauss I'm looking at is it's not Levi, it's Engelbert. Like Humperdink? Yes, Engelbert Strauss. <laughs> Engelbert Humperdink Strauss. Okay. All right, let's see. This is something. This is, again, we're, we're catching up with some stuff that happened in the last two weeks that we didn't get to talk about. And so this was before the vice presidential debate that happened a week or so ago. Uh, some uh, congressman or representative, I'm not going to mention names or parties here, tweeted out. And this actually came out about 12 hours before the actual debate started. I haven't seen much coverage of last night's vice presidential debate in the media. This doesn't really surprise me as one of any names of the candidates here as as one of them absolutely destroyed the other. I don't see how voters can vote after that kind of debacle. And so, like I said, this went out 12 hours before the debate. And then he got called out for it on media uh, in, in social media, especially, and all he did was come up with these excuses. And uh, one of those excuses was, "I've been scheduling my tweets about the White Sox losing all season, at least this far ahead of the ball game, and nobody's ever complained then." <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, Mark, you sent this to me. I think either you or or, or, or our buddy Mitch did the uh, kind of some numbers of the from the last season. With the pitch clock and the stolen bases. So this tweet I see is from Bob Nightingale, which he's usually in on these kind of things. 3,617 stolen bases this year. The most since 1915. Wow. Yeah, and nobody, like nobody came close to 130 still. Right, of course not. One, what do you think is more, sorry to delve into a Ricky Henderson question here, but which do you think is more likely to be broken first, if at all? Ricky Henderson's single season stolen base record or his career stolen base record? Man, I don't know. That career stolen base record just seems way out of hand. Then again, so does stealing over 100 bases, let alone, I mean, come on. That, not, no one's even close. So Ellie De La Cruz led baseball with 67 stolen bases this year. And and he's a guy that you know that if he gets on base and has an open base, he can steal it if he wants to oh, at yeah. any point. But I, I mean that was the the high. Otani had 59 and then Bryce Terang mm-hmm. with Milwaukee had 50. I mean yeah. those guys that's not even half. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, I mean when's the last time you saw somebody steal Half. It, uh, Vince Coleman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, that hard. exactly. Looking at this list, though, of the on base percentage, Ellie De La Cruz's on base percentage is only 339. Otani's is 390. He's a freak. But also, when he starts pitching again, he's not going to be stealing bases, at least not this many. Uh, right. Bryce Terang's on base is 316. Ooh. Jose Caballero, who came in fourth. With 44 stolen bases, his on-base percentage was 283. I mean, wow. that's if you're going to steal bases, you need to get on base. Yeah, and my gosh, I, I mean, often. except for Otani, who a lot of those I'm guessing were intentional walks. He's the only one out of this group that's getting intentionally walked, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that 130 in a season, nobody 
even comes close to being able to get on base enough and then steal to even come close to that. Yeah, I think you, you would need you would need a complete freak of nature like Ricky was. Yeah, and I just I don't think either of them are going to get broken, which is fine yeah. with me. But it's just, you know, you know, he's he really was a once. Some people say once in a lifetime. Maybe he was once in baseball player. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I I don't even say generational. I mean, he in terms of stolen bases. Yeah, he's absolutely the all time best. Not even close. No one can argue otherwise. I mean, come on. I don't that I hadn't really even thought of that until we just looked that up as to who you know how many stolen bases Ellie stole this year. I can't uh, believe our show went off on a Ricky tangent. <laughs> I know it. Well, I've been talking about the Mets and Ricky, and then we talked about the A's all last week. I'm, I apologize for it. <laughs> <laughs> but how about two thirty six for the average nine inning baseball game? Yeah, how about that? I mean, I remember. There was one year the the Mariners played nothing but marathon games. I, I two thirty six back then would have been like heaven. Yeah, I, I I remember we talked about this a couple of episodes ago. We hate the commissioner for many many reasons, but these rule changes that he's made, we all kind of like. We've admitted. Well, I, I say all you and I kind of like. Yeah. And I haven't seen people complaining about the pace of a game. I mean, it's kind of changed the game for sure. It's added a whole new kind of element, and nobody seems to be complaining. No. And and we'll talk about we'll talk about that again here when we get down to some of our debuts that I have that I want to talk about today. All right, Mark. Now this one surprised me because this is a Mariners related thing. Okay. But I got it from watching an Astros game. Okay. So you say Kikuchi, who of course came over from Japan and started in Seattle yes. before he then he was in Toronto and then he was traded to traded to Houston this year down right. the stretch. Well, he and Daniel Vogelbach are apparently besties. Really? They're such besties that he named his son after Daniel Vogelbach. <laughs> You named him his son Vogelback? No, I, I mean, that would be great. Or Vogie. But uh, Leo Daniel Kikuchi. Wow. Which is, is funny because when he was with the Mariners, he did not speak English yet. But he and Vogel Snacks became uh, quick buddies. I can see that. That's a, that could be like a fish out of water TV show. I mean, it absolutely could. I I want to be friends with Daniel Vogelback. He seems like a blast to me. <laughs> I don't want to use the word jolly because it kind of connotates I, know, things, I was but. really trying to, yeah, I was steering so, I mean, I think you could hear me struggling to steer the wheel <laughs> and not say that. Well, uh, I thought I'd jump in then because we wouldn't want to miss out on that. Because <laughs> I do have a thing for baseball players that have to turn their whole body to look to one side because their necks are too thick. And that is a Daniel Vogelback trait. <laughs> Tommy John. Uh, let's talk yes. about Tommy John for a minute. Tommy John claims he knows he's wh- why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Okay. This is bonkers. So he was on the Michael K show, and he was asked why he didn't think he was in Cooperstown. And this was his answer. Quote, maybe because I voted for Donald Trump. Probably. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. If I knew, I could do something, and I'd do it, but I can't. End quote. So he's claiming that because of who he voted for in one of these last elections, he's not in the Hall of Fame. Yet that person that he voted for that he claims is why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Tommy John was only on the the Hall of Fame ballot from 1995 through 2009, which is well before the guy he talked about ran for president in 2016, 2020 or this year. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Tommy John has never received more than 31.7% of the vote, where you need 75, obviously, to get into the hall. Uh, He he has been eligible via the Veterans Committee in 2011, 2014, 2018, and 2020. So two of those were while that guy was in office. But he says that this is why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Because, uh, would anybody have even known who he voted for unless he said it right there? <laughs> yeah, there's probably a committee. 
you know, going, we got to, we got to check on Tommy John's votes. He, 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 he doesn't have any room to complain because his name gets mentioned just as often or more often oh, than any member than of the hall of any fame. Any hall of famer. Absolutely. Yeah. If you watched one playoff game last night, I am guessing that they said Tommy John's name probably five to six times at exactly. minimum. And it's never in vain. No. And, and and let's say it was the Yankee Royals game. I'm sure Babe Ruth was mentioned at some point during sure, the, the game. Sure. I'm sure he wasn't mentioned five to six times, though. Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, they probably were all mentioned. But I, yeah, I bet you're right. Tommy John was mentioned much more. Yeah, and it's always about a career reviving or possible career reviving surgery. It's not like he had a disease named after him. All right. Mark, we are a safe for work podcast, right? We we don't swear. Of course. We we beat things out when when you know when they need to be. We don't say well, I mean we don't say certain words at all. Sometimes we'll hint about things. But generally, we let other people do it. This is something. This is a clip from I think it's sometime this season. And uh, I'm just gonna let I'm just gonna let it speak for itself. But Brad Hand is no longer here. Pierce Johnson's on the IL, so it's a solo mission for Master Boney tonight, which is kind of fitting, I suppose. And he takes a strike at the knees. <laughs> Now, there was prep work in there, right? You're not just Had coming up that off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Just the fact that he figured that out. Yeah. And that would probably be the last time we ever talk about Travis Masturboni on this podcast. We're going we're gonna to try to to do better. Mark, I, I saw this on social media, and it was a, a really good point. Uh, the last two teams that have relocated in Major League Baseball, the Expos and the A's, is Major League Baseball making the teams with the best uniforms relocate? Ooh. And if so, who's next? Yeah, that's scary. The Expos with those with those pinwheel hats, and those are just such great uniforms. Obviously, the A's Kelly Green uniforms are literally my favorite uniform of all time. Completely original. So who's next? Who who of the current uniforms, you know, you can't think back to the the pirates that wore those gold uniforms with the pipe hats and the star jewel stars. It has to be current uniforms. Who is the next coolest uniform? You know, I usually despise conspiracy theories, but this one I think's got merit. So who who who's this team? I don't know who's got the coolest uniforms. Yeah, I, I think that's one of those things where you need a couple of decades to look back on. Well, I mean, if the Brewers consistently wore their kind of 80s uniforms. Oh, yeah, I love those. Then they would, and they're the smallest market team in baseball until the, the A's moved to Vegas, apparently. But uh, <laughs> maybe it is the Brewers. Yeah, well, I hope they don't have to move. But uh, this is what the conspiracy theory says. Uh, so, Mark, I got a quiz for you. Not really a oh, quiz. No. But I was, I was doing some minor league baseball stuff and going through time. And I wanted to see how good your memory was of the PCL teams when you were working for the Tacoma Tigers. Okay. Okay. Because I was going through some of these teams and I remember most of these teams nicknames and I wanted to see if you did. So we're going to start with the Northern (laughs) division, the Vancouver Canucks. Well, the Canadians, which yes. Canucks is a uh, is a, managed by Terry Bevington. Oh wow! Went on yeah, I remember managed that. The White Sox, the Portland. This one should be easy. Beavos, Beavers. Yep, uh, the Twins club at that time. This is still these guys are still around. Calgary, the Cannons. Yeah, yes. that's right. The Cannons. The the red uniforms. Uh, those were the Mariners. Yeah, the red and orange. Yeah, that was great. Yep. That was the Mariners uh, club at that point. They were. The Edmonton. Uh, Trappers. There you go. Nice. Uh, they were the Angels. And then the Tacoma Tigers. You already know that one. Uh, this is some of the all-time greatest uniforms ever. The Albuquerque. Oh, the Dukes. The yes. Dukes. Yeah, those are great. Oh, Terry Collins managed them in 88. Wasn't there an episode of... What was that? He was the father and Little House on the Prairie, and then he did oh, a show. Uh, you're where talking he was about the Heaven one? Heaven with Heaven Can Wait or something? No, like that. that's a movie. Yes, um, but yes, uh, yeah. Didn't wasn't there something with the Albuquerque Dukes in one episode that they went 
and had to save somebody. I don't, I never watched the show. You are, you're way out of my realm here. I, I swear <laughs> there was something with the Albuquerque Dukes on that, but my wife would probably know. Yeah. Let's see here. What about uh, Las Vegas? What about it? What was their team name? Oh, oh. <laughs> Las Vegas was the stars. Yeah, there you go. Why are you being belligerent? Where I'm asking you. <laughs> I, I didn't mean it to be belligerent. Uh, how about this? Another great. Oh, wow. There are some great hats and logos. The Tucson. The Toros. Yeah, yes, the absolutely. Astros, that great hat. And these were these might be my favorite hats in all of minor league history. The Phoenix. Yes, the Phoenix Firebirds. Yes, there you go. The, and it was a baseball, but it had flames that were like yes. wing. Oh, my goodness. It was yeah, beautiful. very cool. That was uh, that was the Giants Farm Club. They were managed by Wendell Kim, which for yep. some, wow, that's weird because I just read something about Wendell Kim this week, and I had not remembered that name in probably twenty years. Right, uh, and then the uh, Colorado Springs, the Sky Sox, the Sky Sox. They were the Cleveland AAA team managed by Steve Swisher at that point. But those are some good. Yeah, oh, there were some good good uniforms and hats oh, yeah. here. Yeah, I wash most of those uniforms too. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the those Firebirds hats, the Toros and the Dukes uniforms, and then the Cannons, and I liked the Trappers too. Those were those are my favorites. I'll give you a little inside dope about those Dukes uniforms. Mm-hmm. You wash them enough, the red starts to come off and bleed onto the white, so those uniforms are, are actually a very light pink. Oh, <laughs> I can imagine, especially back in the in the eighties. I mean, I'm I'm guessing the care that went into the uniforms today was not there, and I'm guessing the wash technology was not as great as it was. Okay. Hey, what now. are you saying? Uh, <laughs> look, all I can tell you is we're probably going to get mentioned on a laundry website now. I'm on those all the time, so that's. Uh, I can. We should have a, a sponsorship where I, I give uh, laundry tips. Yeah, there or, or just a video podcast of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh boy, I bet no one would watch that. <laughs> uh Mark, this show is debuting on October 11th. Now, there were no I think there were three player debuts, but none of which I had heard. Well, no, I I take that back. None of which were in, needed to be spoken about. But a couple of things happened today that is kind of in our uh, two strike noise universe. First of all, in 1960, this happened. In the top of the ninth inning. Well, a little while ago when we mentioned uh, that this one uh, in typical fashion was going right to the wire, little did we know. Mark Dittmar throws. Here's a swing and a high five. Now, that was Bill Mazeroski hitting the walk-off home run against our for, uh, former guest, Ralph Terry of the Yankees. One of the all-time greats right there. Yeah. Like, just a great guy to talk with. Seven. Uh, that was Game 7 of the World Series to give the Pirates the win in the game and obviously the series. Please, if you haven't listened to those Ralph Terry episodes, please go back and do because uh, it was incredible. And I... When I was grabbing that sound, Mark, I watched the clip again. Yeah. And I, I kicked myself because I came up with questions <laughs> that we didn't ask him. Right before he threw that pitch, uh, there was a visit to the mound. And oh, I, wow. I want to know what was said because the next pitch, Bill Mazeroski hits that home run. So, I mean, uh, I, I'd really like to know what was said in that meeting. Also, I swear when I watch this, I see somebody beyond that left field wall running after the ball, which contradicts the story that I found and we talked about who knows how long ago about the ball just sitting there until a kid was walking by coming home from school and found it later and had time to go in and try to give it to, to Maz who said keep it. But that happened today, 1960. Also, in 1985, the Cardinals beat the Dodgers 12 to 2 to even up the NLCS. But Vince Coleman suffers an injury, 
when yes. his left leg gets caught, and it is always described as this, the, quote, Bush Stadium's automated tarpaulin. Tarpaulin. They call it a tarpaulin every single time, and I don't, I don't know why. why. Like, everybody just calls it a tarp. Why, when it's automated and at Bush Stadium, is it a tarpaulin? He got me on that one, man. Well, he was trapped under it for about 30 seconds and does not play again the rest of the the season, which, of course, you know what happens to the Cardinals in the World Series with the Royals. Yeah, I, I remember that injury and just being completely puzzled by it. I was puzzled by what a tarpaulin was when they, <laughs> when I knew about tarps. But yeah, I also, why do you really need an automated tarpaulin? It's just something that something's going to go wrong and not be able to work. Like just the point. Have the ground. What does the grounds crew have to do anyway? It's a ninety percent turf field. They Maybe gotta, they were trying to make it completely unmanned. <laughs> All they have to do is sweep dirt back into the little cutouts <laughs> after the game, pound yes. the mound, and you're gone. Maybe you need some better sweepers. Bring in some some, some pe- curlers. Curlers. There you go. Yeah, I wonder if curlers ever find work in the off season as grounds crew. If I were if I were a stadium with turf, I would really appreciate a professional hand <laughs> sweeping dirt back into where it's supposed quickly. to be. Quickly. I mean, they, you probably wouldn't have to pay them that much because they if they were on the clock, they would get done very quick. And but this is the deep stuff we talk about. This on is this <laughs> enough of our union podcast show telling you how to get <laughs> stuff done. All right, Mark, that's going to do it for the main part of the show. Like I said, this is just a bunch of stuff that I keep transferring from show to show because we've had other things pop up that I just wanted to get out before they were all too long ago. So, Mark, before we get into Wax Packs Heroes, I just want to talk about Wax Packs Heroes for a second. We've made our own version of war. Yes, we have. Instead of baseball reference war or fan reference war, we have... Instead of B-War or F-War, it's two war <laughs> Oh, I got you. <laughs> Which is essentially just B-War plus or minus our rules, which right. we'll get to in a minute here. Because we're going to tell you how we play Wax Packs Heroes after we play this song about Wax Packs Heroes. Wax Pack Hero! Gotta pull the Wax Pack Hero! All right, so before we get into it here, let's go over the rules. And we do have a special rule for this week as well. What we're going to do, we're going to open up some cards. In this case, they are some cards provided by a listener that Mark will tell you about here in a minute. They are some 1990 tops. So we are going to be taking the 1990 Baseball Reference War, and we're going to go head-to-head, card versus card. First one to five is the winner. But we've got some things that can add on to that war. Anything that meets our 80s baseball aesthetics, which are things like real stirrups, where we can see sanitary socks. They're wearing anything on their face, essentially glasses flip down shades if they've got a good mustache well even if they've got a bad one we're gonna give them a tenth of a point but if they've got a really good one we'll give them an extra tenth of a point uh, eye blacks we haven't seen any nose rings yet or any piercings of any sort no i don't believe we have yeah, but uh, that would all be an extra tenth of a point. But if we see some things that we don't like, like two-in-ones, those the, the bane of everybody's existence except for Kent Herbex, uh, that's going to be a minus tenth of a point. If the uh, person on the card won any awards that year, that means Rookie of the Year, Cy Young, MVP, Gold Glove, or they were an all-star, that is a half a point each. If there's a Hall of Famer on the card, whether they are the focus of the card or not, that is a plus one. One, an entire point of war. If Ricky Henderson or Nolan Ryan appears on any card, whoever pulls it, if it's Ricky, I get plus five. If it's Nolan, Mark gets plus five. Any pop culture references we can easily find, that is a half a point, unless they appeared on Seinfeld, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, or The Simpsons, in which you get a full point each. 
if they appeared in the Mitchell Report or were suspended for bad things during their playing career, that is a minus a half a point. And Mark and I have decided we're going to have a special rule this episode where uh, if a player is in an Oakland A's jersey, you're going to get an extra, what do you want, a half a point or a full point? Yeah, let's go full point. Full point. All right. So that's that's a special rule just for today. Again, just a tip of the cap to my Oakland Athletics, and uh, it might come back sometime in the in the next season. We might have a new role. But uh, looking at the scoreboard, Mark, I am leading you ten to six. We're playing first one to twenty, so you know I'm basically already won halfway there. Nothing, I love how you don't believe in jinxing yourself. Nothing could ever possibly happen to uh, to this lead that I have. But these 1990 tops, they are from someone with a very unusual name. Yeah, at first I read it as Tim Johnson, but then I noticed there was a T in it. So I guess it's John Stone. John St- J. John Stone, the late. Oh, Tim Johnston. Oh, okay. That's that's uh, I got it. I figured it out. <laughs> Couldn't be related. No, I bet he's got the coolest brother on the planet. Oh, I didn't know you had another brother, but uh, thank you very much for the cards. So we've got some cards ready to go here. Mark, who gets which pack? You get to select, my friend, left or right. Oh, the left has treated me well. That's true. The left, and you keep winning. Okay. All right. So you get to be the visiting team, though. All right. as, uh, As the playoffs have proved, that don't mean jack. Right. All right. So here's your first card. A Blue Jays shortstop, who I remember being a pretty darn good shortstop, Tony Fernandez. And then a pretty good second baseman when he had to move over later in his career. Yeah. I mean, he was he was the rock in the infield for those Blue Jays teams. And then at second base, it was Alfredo Griffin and then obviously Roberto Alomar. uh, Right. There as well. Then who yet? Ed Sprague at third. And you had the crime dog at first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Overall, 17 years in the big leagues, 12 with Toronto. And then, wow, he really moved around at the end of his career. San Diego, the Mets, Cleveland, Cincinnati, the Yankees, and the Brewers. In 1990, no awards to speak of. He did lead the league in triples with 17. Hit 276, 352 on base, Four home runs, 66 RBI, and 26 stolen bases for an OPS plus of 103. And that is a war of 4.5. I guess this is for me, huh? So, Yeah, nice one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take a 4.5. Now, he usually had a mustache as well. Uh, anything going on there? I'm trying to tell. It's, it doesn't look like it. It's the, not the, the one time he was clean shaven. Yeah, I'm serious. You can tell. <laughs> no, I wasn't doubting you. I was more getting mad. <laughs> it was at the him. one time he was going yeah. to shave, yes. <laughs> Let's see. Won a World Series in 93 with the Blue Jays. He was traded by Toronto with Fred McGriff to the Padres for Roberto Alomar and Joe Carter. So I guess they were never actually double play combination since they were traded for each other. <laughs> it's, it's funny how that works out, but yeah. Um, so f- Tony Fernandez uh, unfortunately passed away in 2020 when he had some kidney problems. So yeah, RIP yeah. to the big guy up there. Sa- he was from San Pedro de Macaris. Imagine that. Yeah, I bet you you how he did not get off that island. He didn't walk Only off that way. island. <laughs> All right. So uh, I got a 4.5. Can you beat that? I'm going to have a rough time with Philly's pitcher, Ken Howell. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> I'm going to get killer mustache points, though. You should see this thing. Does it look like a toupee is attached to his face? Yeah, it's it's big and bushy. All right. Well, there's two-tenths of the point right off the bat for you, then. Let's see. Ken Howell, overall, seven years in the big leagues, five with the Dodgers, two with the Phillies. 1990 was his final season at age 29, he went 8-7 and seven with a 4.64 ERA, 106 innings pitched, 106 hits given up, 70 strikeouts for an 82 ERA+. plus. The year before this, in 1989, he led the league with 21 wild pitches. He did <laughs> wow. not have double digits any other time in his career. 
Weird. That is, yeah, uh, that's kind of strange. So overall, that will give you a war of minus 0.3. Now you do get two tenths of a point for the mustache. So you're at only at minus 0.1. Uh, you just just snuck by me there. Anything else on that card going to help you out? Absolutely not. Well, get this. He was traded by the Dodgers with Juan Bell and Brian Holton to the Orioles for Eddie Murray. So he's traded for a Hall of Famer, but I mean, you know, at the tail end of his career. But still, you say I was traded for Hall of Famer Eddie Murray. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, he's passed away as well in 2018 because of uh, some pancreas issues. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Can we just stay healthy here, guys? (laughs) (laughs) And that goes to everybody, not just the the guys on the cards. To all listeners, can we just stay healthy? (laughs) We're getting old. Please. All right. So I'm on the board. One nothing. All right. So now you have this guy was this guy was a pretty good hitter. Third baseman for the Royals, Kevin Alka Seitzer. Nice. Now, I want to say he's like the batting coach for one of these teams that's in the playoffs. I guess we'll find out here in a minute. I swear somebody just mentioned and showed him in the dugout during the playoffs here. Seitzer, 12 years in the big league, six with the Royals, five with the Brewers, and then Cleveland and Oakland. Let's see, in 1990 with the Royals... He hit 275, 346 on base, which is better than any of those stolen base leaders we talked about earlier, except for Otani. Six home runs, 38 RBI, and a 103 OPS plus. And that is a war of 3.2. Wow. Is there anything else going to help me on that card? No, I believe Mr. Seitzer was always clean shaven, and I can't tell if the stirrups are real or fake. All right. Actually, you know what? I'm going to give him real stirrups. All right, we'll take that. Looking at, uh, I was just looking at one foot, but I think, I think we have enough evidence to overturn the call. <laughs> okay, so that'll be a three point three. Well, uh, he, he's alive. We've had we've had Kevin Seitz here before. It doesn't his Wikipedia doesn't say anything about coaching at this point, but we've mentioned that he he owns and operates a baseball and softball training facility called Mac and Sites Baseball and Softball, along with former teammate Mike McF- But he's alive. That's the, the good thing here. Uh, so, first living player. Yeah, so that's a 3.3 for me. Who's All right, name? and I get to come at you with another great mustache. <laughs> so, again, starting off strong, uh, we're going to go pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, Mike Smithson. You said big mustache and Red Sox, and I guess we should definitely acknowledge Louis Tiant's passing. That's uh, uh, yes, since our absolutely. last show. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about him next week. Make sure, yeah, please do, because Louis Tiant, he was a character. And oh man, a pretty darn good pitcher too. Yeah. Let's see, Mike Smithson, eight years in the big leagues, four with Minnesota, two with Boston, two with the Rangers. The unfortunate news for you, or maybe it's fortunate for you, his last year in the big leagues was 1989. Oh, bummer. So, and that was his last year in baseball, period. Well, at least we have this card to commemorate him with. Yeah. Well, it. I mean, I definitely remember him. It sounds like the good mustache is all you've got. Nothing else on that card going to help you out? No, he's warming up in a jacket. You can't see any syrups, so. Oh, is it? Uh, is is this with the Red Sox? Yes, I know. I, I know what that card looks like. <laughs> That's weird. For you Mike, you've got plenty of those comments right there. Nah, nothing really exciting to talk about uh, with Mike Smithson, except for that gives me another win there. So that's two to nothing for me. Going on to the next card. Yeah, two to nothing already. Oh, geez, and now you get another. Although. This game isn't necessarily kind to closers. You're going to get one of the greatest of all time. Okay. Boston Red Sox, Lee Smith. We've talked about Lee Smith quite a bit, especially yes. how his slow saunter out to the, the mound that was to help his buddies in the ground crew <laughs> get See, the OT. I, <laughs> I thought you were going to say we, were, we want to talk about, make sure we mention that he's still alive. Oh, yes, we do want to say he's 66 years old, almost 67. Hall of Famer, Lee Smith. So I like that. It's a point on the board right there. Usually had a mustache, too, so I'm guessing that'll help as well. 
But in uh, 1990, let's see, split time between the Red Sox and the Cardinals. Overall went 5-5 five and five with a 2-0-6 ERA in 64 appearances, 31 saves, 83 innings pitched, 71 hits, 87 strikeouts for a 188 ERA+. plus. I, I like where this is headed. And that will be a war of 2.2. Plus, he's a Hall of Famer, so that's 3.2. Does he have that mustache? I'm looking. Yeah, he's got it. Oh, this is, I'm not sure if we talked about this or or not, but Buck O'Neill is credited for having scouted uh, Lee Smith. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Buck got it right. All right, so that's a 3.3 for me for the second a card in a row, but the big question is, can you beat it? I don't think so, but we'll try with Kirk Gibson. Never an all-star, Kirk Gibson. Yeah, now remember, though, we have discovered that he is was never an all-star because he was never voted as a starter and passed when he was asked to be a, a selection from the manager. So it's not like he was just ignored. He just said, if I'm not starting, I'm not coming. See, I always thought it was like he was always in the back of someone's mind. Oh, I forgot. I forgot Gibson. Ah, oh, well. <laughs> well, let's see. He was he's a MVP, a two time World Series winner and a manager of the year. And now does Tiger broadcasts overall. Kirk Gibson, 17 years in the big leagues, 12 with Detroit, three with the Dodgers and then the Royals and the Pirates at the end of his career in 1990 with the Dodgers limited to only 89 games. Oh, poor guy. Hit 260, 345 on base, eight home runs, 38 RBI, a 108 OPS plus. And that is a war of 2.5. First round draft pick by the Tigers in uh, 78. Now we know that he at one point held a record for flying a Cessna higher than anybody had ever done before. But anything else on that card going to help you get any points to try and beat me? A nice big mustache. Yeah, I don't see any any pop culture references at all, which is weird because, you know, I guarantee you that that home run is on a TV in some movie or TV show. Multiple yeah, times. It has to be, right? Yeah. Um, but without it being mentioned here, I'm not going to go and watch every TV and movie to find it. But speaking of movies, he resides in Gross Point, Michigan. <laughs> Gross Point Blank. Such a great movie. Such a great movie. You should go watch it today after. There's only two games today. Only but, two games. And then I was going to watch The Lost Boys, though. Oh, okay. Well, you do you. Do you. That will be a 2.7 for you, which is lower than 3.3. Just let me check with the, yeah, the yeah, judges confirm. That is uh, another win for me. I'm up 3 nothing. All right, next card. Next card, pretty darn good third baseman for the Blue Jays, Kelly Gruber. Kelly Hans Gruber? Sure. I guess he was at third base uh, as, lo- as along with Ed Sprague for the Blue Jays when we yeah. were. We, I, I, I was just naming Blue Jays. Apparently, they were, they never played together. But I was I just, <laughs> I threw them all out there. Let's see, ten years in the big leagues for the Groob, nine with Toronto, one with the California Angels. Good news for me, he was an All Star that year and a Gold Glove, and came in fourth in the MVP validating. But they couldn't get past the A's in the playoffs. Too bad. Hit two seventy four, three thirty. 31 home runs, 118 RBI, 14 stolen bases, and a 127 OPS plus. And that is good for a 4.2. He was, let's see, an all-star and a gold glove. So that'll be a whole point for that. Let's see, did he have that kind of blonde mustache at that point? I see nothing as far as the mustache. Okay. First round draft pick by Cleveland in 1980. That's right. Forgot about that. Was he? I wonder if he knew another blonde mustache, Corey Snyder. <laughs> they look. They look somewhat similar. Published an autobiography, Kelly at Home on Third. I don't think we. I don't. I'm not sure that an autobiography counts. Were, were people clamoring for a Kelly Gruber autobiography? Um, 
clamoring. <laughs> Maybe was, clamoring's too strong. I'm very anti-clamoring, personally. <laughs> there was there was a little bit of grumbling, but really <laughs> not not a whole lot. Uh okay, so that's a 5.2. I'm still I'm feeling pretty I'm feeling pretty confident here. Oh, how about this? The Toronto media nicknamed him Sanos. X-A-N-T-H-O-S. Meaning blonde after his long flowing blonde hair. Nice. And he was he was voted the city's most eligible bachelor. Wow. Way to go, Grooves. Nice. All right. Uh, enough of the Grooves talk. 5.2. Can you beat it? Okay. In, a, in, in another... Year I I could be, I could catch you with this guy, but not not with nineteen ninety. It's just not going to happen. Pitcher for the Astros, Mike Scott. Yeah, yeah, boy, especially in like 86, 87, 80, you know, eighty five, right? right around there. Completely dominant years. Yeah, uh, let's see, Mike Scott, thirteen years in the big leagues, nine with Houston, four with the Mets in nineteen ninety, his penultimate season at age thirty five. He just missed his final All-Star game. I mean, the year before he won 20, came right. in second in the Cy Young and was an All-Star. Uh, but in 1990, he went 9-13, and 13, but still only had a 3.81 ERA, yeah. which that's pretty good for 1990. 205 innings pitched, 194 hits allowed, so fewer hits than innings. Struck out 121, but a 98 ERA plus, and that equals a war of 1.6, which is not bad, but compared to the groups, not so much. All right. Well, I've got I've got a Met for you this time around. All right. All right. And I got to make sure I pronounce this right. Don Ase. Don Ase. A A S E. Yes. Google auto corrects it to Don Asset. Which, let's see if he was an asset in, in 1990. Overall, 13 years in the big league, six with California, four with Baltimore, and then the Mets, Red Sox, and Dodgers for parts of seasons. 1990, final season in the big leagues at 35. He went 3-1, and one, but had an ERA of 4.97. 38 innings pitched, only gave up 33 hits, struck out 24 for a 75 ERA plus, and a war of minus .7. Now, I can guarantee you, though, he has got an 80-grade mustache. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So that'll be a minus 0.5. We've never had him before, so let's see if there's anything. Let's see. Nope. <laughs> there's not. Well, good for the mustache, but that will that'll take me to a minus 0.5. Do you think you can beat that? Um, I, I got a shot, All but right. I'm not positive. All right. All right, this is a pitcher for the Cardinals, Danny Cox. I, he was a starter, right? Yeah, he was a starter. Oh, born in Northampton, England. Wow, you don't have many people born in England making the big mm, leagues. Not really. It's 11 years in the big leagues, six with the Cardinals, <laughs> three with the Blue Jays. He likes the birds, uh, two with the Phillies, and then one with the Bucks. In 1990, he was injured. <laughs> he did not play in the big leagues so you win I this win. round <laughs> this oh boy yeah missed the entire 89 or no he missed the entire 89 season and then in 90 he just uh, was working in the minors till he got back up I still win you still win. well congratulations all right four to mm. one Man, but I think I'm in some trouble here. All right. You got an, a, a Baltimore Oriole record breaker card. All right. And it would be Cal Ripken with 20 home runs his eighth straight season. So your card is Cal Ripken Jr. I'll take it. Could be uh, could be a hard one to beat. Surprisingly enough, he's an all-star. <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was an all-star. Uh, let's see. How many? 19-time all-star. He's a Hall of Famer, of course, as well. So I'll take that. Got some MVP votes, but not. He came in 24th in the MVP balloting. He only hit 250. Had a 341 on base, though. 21 home runs, 84 RBI, and a 114 OPS+. plus. How many games do you think he played this year? No, I'm going to go with 143. No, um, <laughs> 162? Wrong, 161. Oh, they shorted him a game. Yeah, he, two, two two out of three seasons in 88 and 90, the Orioles only played 161 games. 
Let's see here. Uh, overall, though, that will take me to a war of 7.5. It's an all-star, so that'll be 8. He's a Hall of Famer, so that'll take it up to 9. Is he wearing real stirrups in that? Can you see? No, you can only see the upper upper body. Yeah, all right. So probably <laughs> nothing else there. Uh, of course, won the World Series that first year he came up in 19... Uh, well, not the first year, but the first, it's kind of his first... I guess second full year with the Orioles in 1983. And he was a second round draft pick. I just assumed that he was a first rounder. Uh, He's got a bunch of stuff here in pop culture. I know he's got a baseball game on the NES, which is good enough. Uh, Absolutely. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we need to go through too much more. I, you're going to have a hard time beating me. Yeah, I see my card here. Yeah, okay. Well then we'll we'll stop there and say uh who's your card? Red Sox, Rick Sarone. Ah, uh, well you never know. No, I'm pretty sure I know. <laughs> uh well he might have a good mustache. And well he did, does have a good mustache. He's got the song, right? He's the isn't Rick Sarone. I think we're gonna have to relive his like folk song. About the, no, let's the, not relive it. The off season. Okay, well, we'll just bring it up briefly. Uh, Nineteen ninety for the Yankees appeared in forty nine games, three oh two average, three twenty four on base, two home runs, eleven RBI, a ninety nine OPS plus, and that is good for a WAR of positive point seven. Well, you get that any other day, but he had to go against Ripken. Yeah, first round draft pick by Cleveland in nineteen seventy five. And she was traded for Ted Simmons at one point. And, uh, I mean, you, you get the pop culture for the, the song. What was the song called? A uh, Long Run Home. Yeah, Long Run Home. You get that. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to be enough. No. So, all right. Well, another win. Like I said, we're just kind of cruising now. Further behind <laughs> for me. You know, this is going to make the comeback sweeter. We're just cruising now. The score is now 11 to 6, but that will do it for this episode of Wax Packs Heroes. Thanks again to whoever that guy was. We'll never hear from him again for yeah. sending those cards in. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that'll do it for this. If you want more of us, just check out the show notes. Uh, you can find us on all the socials. We are at Two Strike Noise. That is at TWO Strike Noise. And Mark, I'm going to tell him about the email address because that's a little bit more complicated. Sure. Yeah. You got to spell, you got to spell out Two Strike Noise. And that's at gmail.com. So, so is that noise Gmail, G-E-E-M-A-L-E? Yeah, I was just going to mention that. It's not the G-E-E form of Gmail. It's okay. just G a letter. Okay, and it, the mail is is like not like a man. It's the other. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> Listen, now. I want to cover all bases. We've got some really intelligent listeners, but we also have some first timers that I don't, we, we can't gauge them yet. So just <laughs> I'm just trying to be welcoming to everybody. Great man. I <laughs> say so you're okay, you're done. <laughs> oh, Mark is ready to get off of this call with me. Uh, it was a nice show, though. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, again, this is all in the show notes. So if you just go down there, you can click on one of them and it'll take you to any of these that you could want. And we'll let Mark go. <laughs> we'll see everybody <laughs> on the next episode of Two strike noise thank you god bless you have a great day